the goodness of God is always present for us to uh, walk victoriously and live a life that's pleasing to him and yet satisfaction to us. Amen. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. Let's pray and we'll get into the message today. Father, we thank you and everything we've done up to this point has been an attempt to be pleasing to you, not to be entertaining to men. So, Father, I just pray that for the next few moments, as we open your word, that you would anoint my lips and anoint my mind to be able to think clearly and speak concisely what you want your people to hear. I pray that even beyond my ability to articulate your word, Father, that you, by your glorious power, would open the eyes and ears of their understanding so that their hearts and minds would be enlightened to know the truth of what you really have for them. Father, I thank you for the great grace that is upon all of us to hear the word and obey the word and not just be hearers only but doers of the word in kind. So I thank you for it and I give you praise. Angels of the Most High God, we welcome you in this place today. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? amen. Um, you know, I was listening to uh, <laughs> that little Jerry Savelle clip and as many of you know, I've worked for him for a few years on the road and um, <laughs> that clip was the most sought after message that in case you're wondering it's called from um, uh, f- oh, <laughs> I just had it on the tip of my tongue and lost it um, from, no no it'll come to me but it's one of his most sought after messages um, and he preached that early 2000s in uh, Detroit Michigan at Bishop Keith Butler's church and uh, it's just a tremendous tremendous message it'll, it'll come to me before the day is over and I'll give it to you but uh, I encourage you, I've got it in my library at home. I listen to it quite often. I even get it on my phone. So, but uh, that's all right. The devil is a liar. We'll get that to you. Amen. Uh, I want to talk to you about, just like we did last time, from restoration to harvest. Gave you a partial introduction. I want to continue with that introduction. Um, so I'm going to invite your careful attention to the book of Joel. Joel in the Old Testament. Joel, or Joel, uh, 2. Joel 2. And just when you get there, let's just pause there. I want to greet our YouTube audience. I want to thank you all for taking the time, those of you that are watching online. Thank you for your messages of encouragement, and thank you for your love that you're showing towards us by tuning in. More importantly, we're excited about what the Holy Spirit has for you. We encourage you that if you live in the local area of Iowa City, Iowa, or the Metroplex, metro area there, uh, even as we've got people that drive from over an hour away, because the church alive is worth the... So we delight ourselves in having opportunity for you to come and fellowship with us. Don't let things like weather or I don't feel good or whatever, don't let that stuff be obstacles to your success in Jesus. Because you need to have a local church. Whether it's LifePoint or somewhere else, you need to have a local church. So we encourage you to take opportunity. Come visit LifePoint. We're certainly delighted that you're tuned in today for however you got here. Get something to write with. Make yourself comfortable, but don't fall asleep. Just make sure that you're hearing from God this morning. I also want to welcome our first-time guests, those of you that are here for the first time. Maybe you found a way to get to LifePoint and you don't know really what you're doing here. If you give God time, he will explain to you why he brought you here. I fully believe that. I hope you do, too. Would you welcome our first-time guests and our YouTube audience this morning, ladies and gentlemen? Amen. So with that, I want to talk about some things that, that my desire, and I believe the desire of the Holy Spirit, is to make sure that you're hearing practical information uh, because without the ability to put what you hear in uh, motion, it really doesn't do you a whole lot of good. A lot of people have been have come to church or gone to churches for years where the information that they have doesn't translate into anything but, hey, hey, I was at church, had a, had a good time, I think. You know, what time's a football game start type thing, you know what I'm saying? And so, but what you have to do is understand that the reason why God brings you into a community of believers is for your own success, not for his benefit. Say amen to that. The Lord doesn't really get anything out of you being in his house. Because whatever praise, whatever praise, whatever, whatever uh, offering that we've offered, we could do that without being here. So then what is it or who's benefit, who really benefits from being in the house of God? Is it God or is it us? It's us. And clearly, you know, as is found in more than one place, the Lord encourages us, especially in uh, 20, soon will be 2020. Gosh, 
Christmas. Man, it is March already. Uh, why we still have snow and ice in the ground, I'm still trying to figure that out. But when I moved to Iowa, they told me that March is coming. They said, always remember March is coming, but March is here. And it is like minus 11 outside. I ain't trying to hear all that. I'm just saying, you know. So, but with that being said, what I recognize is that whether I'm in Iowa or I'm in Texas, whether I've been in any place, you know, New York, grew up in New York, whether I'm in North Carolina, whether, well, it doesn't matter where I am. If I'm vacation, if I'm just at the mall, if I'm at the grocery store, God is, God is there. Amen. And in God being there, God's plan, and he makes it very clear, and so what we're going to do is try to spell it out a little bit for you. I don't plan on preaching today. I want to teach a little bit, if that's okay. But I want you to understand what God's intent is. And we don't find it just in one place of Scripture. Uh, what we find in, in the book of Genesis, I'm not going to turn there, hold your place in Joel. What we find is that God's desire, uh, many, let me say it this way, many things that we find in God are not necessarily spelled out in Scripture. Does that make sense? Um, how many authors do we have in here? Would you lift your hand? I know we got a few. Come on. We got one. We got a couple authors. I'm not just talking about by faith that you've written a book. Raise your hand. Why are y'all so. Okay, well, that's okay. By faith is cool too. Okay. Anyway, y'all are shy, but that's this morning. My wife has written, TJ's written some, some things. Um, it is one thing to, to read the writings of the author, it is another thing to know the author. And God has made himself available to us so that we would know him. That's his whole, that's the whole purpose. When he, when, he, when he creates Adam and Eve, he doesn't have to create Adam and Eve because he just wants some more beings. Right. He creates Adam and Eve so that he can bring about his plan from the beginning. His plan from the beginning involves you and I. It involves mankind. Um, and involving mankind, what his plan does is it is, it is brought about by his own concept, come on now, his own concept of you and I in Adam and Eve. Now, this is important. I, I, you know, I, I take my time with this kind of stuff because I know not everybody's on the same level, spiritually or consciously or even intellectually. And I'm on the bottom rung there, so I'm just saying. But I recognize that what God intended for Adam and Eve, he intended for Tommy and Lynette. Amen. And you need to put your own name in there. So with that being said, his plan was to bring about the same type of existence on the earth that he had in heaven. How do we know that? Jesus says, thy will be done. He didn't say in heaven. He said on earth. Why? Because his will is already being done in heaven. Is, can, I, can I just submit to you that his will in heaven is prosperity? Stop thinking about what you read online. His will in heaven is healing. Have you ever read of a sick person in, in heaven? You know what happens when people die? If death, if death were the final rung on the ladder, when they die, they get healed. And that, that's a form of healing, resurrection. Never to die again. So my point is, what God desired to do in Adam and Eve and in this earth, he's going to do it. He's already started the process. It's already completed work. But he's going to do it through us. Look at your neighbor. He's going to use you saying he's going to use you. OK, so now this is important. Now, reason why I'm going down this this road and we find it in Joel, Joel 2, 20. When you have it, say amen. And I'm going to read from the expanded Bible. You can put it up in the King James, gentlemen, if you would, ladies. Joel 2, 20 says, I will force. Let me make sure I'm in the right place. Yes. I will force the army from the north to leave your land. Are you there? Drive the northern one far from you, he says, and go into a dry, empty, desolate land. Their soldiers in front will be forced into the Dead Sea and those in the rear into the Mediterranean Sea. Their bodies will rot ew, and stink ew, and foul smell will rise. The Lord has surely, what does it say? Done great things, a wonderful thing. Is it done? Is it done at the time of the writing? Not in the natural, it's not. In the spiritual, it is. Because what is God doing? Through the prophet Joel, he's prophesying about what's going to happen. Remember, Isaiah 46, 10, I think. Somebody can confirm that for me. God, before he ever starts something, he finishes it. 
Before he started your life in this earth, it was already a finished work. And if it's not looking like you think it should, the question is, are you following God's pattern? Because if you're following God's pattern, all you got to do is keep going. You can't get tripped up on your last night escapade that you really wasn't planning on doing, but you was out there partying and shouldn't have been. See, I thought we were holy. I am holy. But my holiness is not based on my activity. It's on his righteousness. Am I holy when I party? Probably not. So then how do I get back holy? First John 1 and 8. If I confess my sin. Come on now. It's not that you ain't never going to party again. Oh, I, better, I better leave that alone. Because I better leave that alone because I'm open up a worm, can of worms I ain't really try. All I'm saying to you is that this is a completed work in your life. And what you've got to do is understand you don't need the partying to be significant in the earth. You don't need the drugs. You don't need the sex. You don't need all that. What you need is God's word. And if we lock in on this and what he's already promised, then we're promised to get where he wants us to go. All right. So he goes on to say, he says, um, and, and those in the rear into the Mediterranean Sea, their bodies will rot and stink. I, I read that. The Lord has surely done a wonderful thing or great things. Verse 21, land, don't be afraid. I'm going to keep going for a few more verses. Be happy and full of joy because the Lord has done a wonderful thing. I ask you again, has he already done it? No. They are looking forward to what God has said and recognizing that, you know what, I am not caught up in the emotional uh, position where I am right now. And what I want to talk to you today primarily is, is going to involve your emotions. Your feelings. Your feelings have no business running your life. And yet, many charismatic, know the signals, hallelujah, hallelujah, Texas two-step or Holy Ghost hip-hop, whichever one you want to do. I don't do that because I don't feel that. Your feelings have nothing to do with who you are and God's reality in your life. That's like somebody saying, you know, you know, everybody that works in here gets a paycheck, I hope, unless you volunteer. And if you're in a position to volunteer, that means you're getting a paycheck from somewhere else probably. Amen. Somebody can... Are you feeling me? So you got money. So you can't say, well, you know what? You get to the end of the month, I didn't have any money. Amen. No, what you didn't have was discipline on how you spent the money. <laughs> I wish I could get a better amen. The reality of it is, is we, we can't say how many hours, I used to notice, how many hours in, in a week? To what? Come on, mathematicians. How many? Come on, y'all help me. Somebody Google it. What are y'all not Googling it for? How many, no, how many hours, how many hours, in a, total hours in a week, not work hours, how many total hours? 168, thank you. Out of 168 hours, you can't say I didn't have time to read God's word. Come on. I had two hours on a Netflix film. And only worked 40. Not my wife, but Jezreel, she put in 60. Anyway, what I'm saying to you is that what God is doing in your life, he's going to base it on how big your want to is, and your want to can, may not, cannot be dictated by your emotional state. So he prophetically tells them here, he says, and he, I love how he does. He says, by the mouth of the prophet, he goes on to say, the land, don't be afraid, be happy. I'm in verse 21, full of joy because the Lord has done a wonderful thing. If we could get the concept of what God has done as opposed to what he's going to do. We stand up in prophetic lines and we wait and we want to hear prophetic word about what God is going to do. And all I can do as a prophet of God is tell you what, God, confirm what God has already said to you. People want to say, well, I'm a millionaire. Not if you ain't got no discipline, baby. And I stand up and say, well, God called you to be a millionaire. He might have called you that. But if you ain't got no discipline in your life, I'm lying to you. And you lying to yourself. Okay. What's the title? Of Restoration to Harvest identifying emotional pitfalls. 
Because our emotions, we come in church, you guys know me. Now, I'm not saying anything new. You guys know me. I, I don't want you to check out emotionally, but I don't want you coming here emotionally driven. Lord, Jesus, about 7.40 this morning. Where JT at? What time you show up in my house? What time you text me? I don't know. Seven something. I was not emotionally driven when he texted me and told me he was outside. I was emotionally driven to keep sleeping. I was, you know how you get into that in-between, you know, you know. The REM sleep is long gone. I'm just, just lazy, don't want to get out the bed. I know y'all want me to be some spiritual giant where I jump out the bed and get on my knees or raise my hands, but y'all ain't doing it, so don't expect it of me. <laughs> Especially in nine degree weather. Are you feeling me? But the reality of it is, is that my emotional state didn't keep me out of church this morning. Amen. Didn't keep you out either. Amen. Oh, that's the best amen y'all got. Y'all here. Why do I say that? Because somebody's emotions kept them out. And it is, it is people that have not understood the emotional trap that the enemy uses against us to cause us to stay in the same condition that we've always been in. What God does to the prophet Joel, he says, listen, be happy, be full of joy. I've already done what I'm telling you I'm going to do. Say the word restore. Okay, let's keep going. Let me keep reading. I'm run out of time here. So verse 22 says, wild animals, don't be afraid. I love how God speaks to the whole of creation. Because the open pastures have grown grass. The trees have given fruit. The fig trees and the grapevines have grown much fruit. Verse 23, so be happy, people of Jerusalem. Be joyful in the Lord your God. Be in the Lord your God, because he, has, he does what is right. Doesn't God do what is right? Yes. The Bible says he has brought you rain. He has sent the fall rain and the spring rain. Some of, you say, some of that will say what the latter and the early rain in your Bible. Right? For you as before. Verse 24. And the threshing floors will be full of grain. The barrels or the vats will overflow with new wine and olive oil, which is a sign of prosperity. Verse 25, though I sent my great army against you, those swarming locusts and hopping locusts or crawling locusts, the destroying locusts and the cutting or chewing swarming locusts that ate your crops, listen, I will pay you back for those years of trouble. Verse 26, then you will have plenty to eat and be full. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who has done miracles, right, for you. My people will never again be shamed. Then, verse 27 says, you will know that I am among the people of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other God. My people will never be shamed again after this. Amen. So what am I saying? And I'm going to keep going. What am I saying? In other words, this prophetic declaration over Israel is where we live today. We should be living there. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm not Jew by birth. The Bible says that he is a Jew is one of the spirit. Okay, Paul teaches that in the book of Romans. With that being said, what I recognize, there is not this re replacement theology where somehow or another the, the, the Christian church of today, particularly the Western quote unquote body of Christ, has taken the place of the Jews. That is erroneous doctrine. It is a lie. God has a place for the Jews in the kingdom. Don't, mis don't misinterpret that. But what it says, rather, through the teachings of the Apostle Paul, is that you and I have been, say this word, engrafted. We have selectively been chosen by God to not be separate from the, from the prophetic word of Joel, but rather to be full partakers of the reality of it. Listen to me well. So that if God says he will restore Jerusalem and the Jews, that absolutely, undeniably, irrevocably means that he has already restored my life. And what I have to do is recognize that the 45 to 50 years that I have messed it up will not negate the word that says I will restore. Ooh, turn, turn with me. I better slow down. Turn with me to the book of First Peter. Are you all right? Okay. Looking at my time back there. I got you. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. 
We have times of refreshing this evening. We have a wonderful speaker lined up. Great praise and worship. Hope you can come. Thank you, Lord. Hope you're not doing anything. If you're not doing anything, if you're just going to go home and take a nap, you need to get your happy self up. Come out and hear the word. I ain't saying nothing up in here. I ain't got no plan. I got plans, Pastor. First Peter 1, hold your place there. From an emotional context, and I'm just going to try to break this down the way I would do it by leading the Holy Spirit. From an emotional context, when I look at my life and the restoration that has taken place in my life, I can't, I can't talk about your life because only you know that. When I look at my life and the restoration that God has done, one of the first things that he dealt with me about is my own identity. Okay, please hear me well here because I'm going I'm to let the Holy Spirit lead me through this one. Your identity crisis going on right now in your life is the biggest hindrance to you receiving restoration from God. With that being said, he cannot restore you until it lines up with his correct image from the cross forward. I'm going to say it again. Your identity crisis that's going on in your personal life right now that really is being driven by outside forces will not allow him to be able to restore you to where he wants you to be so you can go from restoration to harvest until you begin to see his identity in you from the cross moving forward. Notice I did not say the cross moving backward. I read from Joel, but we don't live there. We are New Testament believers. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, 17, 16 through 20. Write it down. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. This is extremely important because I see people that I am looking forward to. I'm looking to, to look, I'm, I'm trying to get where you at because you, you look, you've been living this life longer than me, even in our marriage. We've been married, we'll be 35, 36 years this year. So I would expect that my son and daughter-in-law, they ain't got to live in our house to understand that mom and dad are doing something right. Are you feeling me this morning? So, so if I'm looking to you, but if, but if at 40 years I decide I don't want her no more, or she say, well, you really ain't satisfying my needs anymore, how many of you know that wasn't, that's not God's idea of restoration? What y'all laughing at? I didn't hear what, I don't want to hear what she said. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. Listen, listen, pull your religious toes in. We're talking this morning. I'm talking this morning. I'm going to tell you what. It ain't harvest when I got to start over with a new one. Ain't no harvest there. Because Robin, what I thought might have been crazy with her might be absolutely insane with somebody else. So if God's going to do anything, he's going to do it in the context with how I line up with her. My God, I line up with her and we line up with the cross. It is not enough. All of you couples out here, it is not enough for just the husband to be lined up, but the wife must be lined up. It is not enough for the wife to be lined up, but the husband must be lined up. Because if not, y'all going to be three degrees off. And can't figure out why you keep going around the same circle. See, God's plan is fully restoration. And I told you last week, restoration in God's eyes is not just making it like it was, Mike, right, Elder? It's like making it better than you could ever imagine. That's like somebody coming in your house out there, and I'm not going to say where it's at, I, but out there where it's all pretty and everything, and taking your house and putting an elevator in it. So when you don't feel like taking the stairs, you can ride, push the button. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. That's like God taking your car and instead of just giving you new wheels and hubcaps, he decided to give you GPS and Wi-Fi in it that's already built in. 24s. Let's bring back the spinners. Y'all remember the spinners? Let me keep going. Glory to God. Let me keep going. Stop it. Stop it. Hush. First Peter. First Peter 1. Because if we're going to believe for this thing, we got to believe for it all. Yeah. What's his name? Lift your hands up. Lift your hands up. Everybody lift your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
We send out a word of, of, of reconciliation because that's the ministry you've given it to, to us. Eric Popelka, come into the kingdom. Stop rejecting the word of righteousness. God's got a plan for you. Wherever you are, he'll find you. And Father, our prayers that you would send forth laborers in the harvest and the fields that will pass his, cross his path that he will listen to. In the name of Jesus, not long, come in now in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on, come on. Because you know, it ain't no fun when you as a husband out here trying to live for God and your wife ain't thinking about what you're doing. Oh, God, I'm going to say it. Uh, I've, never, I've never had to deal with this aspect of it. And I know some of you do. I'm not, trying to, I'm not putting you on the spot. If you don't react, nobody will know. Wives going to one church, husband going to another. Hearing two different things. It ain't God's will. Well, aren't they both saved? I don't know, are they? Husbands coming and wives... I don't like the message. I don't like the preacher. I don't like the music. This ain't got nothing to do with the preacher, the music, or the message, other than just whatever the anointing of God brings across your path. Amen. All right, let me keep going. First Peter 1, you've got it, right? Yes. Verse 1, from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's what? Elect or chosen. People who are away from their homes or exiles because they were, he was writing to that group. Uh, temporary residents, refugees and foreigners and are scattered, he says, uh, particularly talking about the Jewish people, all around Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. In other words, really what we would call Asia Minor. They're all across this area and Paul is talking to them, what we would kind of consider present day Turkey. That's what he's talking about. He says, verse 2, listen to this now, God the Father please hear me, planned long ago to choose you according to his foreknowledge. By what? By making you his holy people, which is the Spirit's work. Look up at me. Did we not just spend the last year and some talking about Galatians and this being the Spirit's work? If it's the Spirit's work, it's not based on how you feel about it. If it's the Spirit's work, it's only based on your acceptance of what God says. And I know that's kind of like a, a statement that just kind of lays out there, but I'm going to tell you what I know and I've noticed as being a shepherd. Most people don't get that. They don't get that. What they get is, um, I got these symptoms in my body. And the symptoms speak louder than God's word in my life. What they get is, I don't have enough to pay the bill. They get that. Because they're faced with that reality every day. But the reality of God's word speaks louder by the Spirit's work than what they see. The Bible says that the things that are seen are temporary. But the things that are what? Unseen. Is the provision that you need unseen? Absolutely it is. Is your body being healed unseen? Absolutely it is. Your healing doesn't show up on an x-ray until God, after God does his work. The bill doesn't show up being paid until they call you and say, well, that's already been taken care of. I've had that happen. That's a good feeling. But it's, all, it's there. You just, you just got to believe it's there. Let, let me keep going. Let me keep going. Uh, is it all right? Let me keep going. Okay. What verse I leave you off at? Verse 2 says, God the Father planned long ago to choose you by making you his holy people. If he didn't make you his holy people, you and I would not be his holy people. Right? He goes on to say, God wanted you to obey him and to be made clean by the blood of the death of Jesus Christ. Do you see that? How did this happen? By the blood, come on, say it with me, by the blood of the death of Jesus Christ. Now he goes on to say, grace and peace be yours more and more. Now, why is he saying that? Because you are a spirit being. Can I talk about our house for a minute? 
Can I talk about last night for a minute? Look, she looked, y'all didn't see that look. Y'all, y'all pa- you see, I paused, right? Because that look was like, um, I don't know. Well, I'm going to be real with you because I want you to understand this. Some of you think that you have to be perfect. Look at your neighbor and then look at yourself. Ain't nobody in this room been perfect. Not even last night. Not even in the last 24 hours. You ain't been perfect. So stop, stop, stop living in a, a deluded or, uh, or living in the illusion that you are. Well, I prayed. So what? That don't make you perfect. I don't care if you talk in tongues. It don't make you perfect. The only thing that makes you perfect is the blood of Jesus. And the reality of it is I've got to keep coming back to that blood because it is a good baseline for me to recognize that without the blood of Jesus, I cannot be holy. But I am holy because he said I'm holy. So then, well, I don't feel holy. There we go again. And if we're honest with each other, most of us have lived our lives in the reality of how we felt about ourselves. Or worse yet, how other people feel about us. They don't like me. And? But you think that's the only person that don't like you? Just because they came up and they had enough boldness or audacity to come tell you they don't like you? They don't like you just because you're a man. I can't change the fact that I'm a man. Wouldn't do it if I could. But I don't like you because you're a man. Whose problem is that? Theirs. But it's okay for them not to like me. It is another thing entirely for me to not like myself. And when I find flaw in me, God help me this morning. When I find flaw in me, it is not a flaw that God has found. But it is rather a flaw that the enemy will use to accentuate the negative and reinforce the the, the flimsiness of my flesh. I know I got a problem with what some of the stuff I say and do, but my problems does not define who I really am. And we've had churches where people want to act like you got to be perfect. You got to have a happy song and a dance in order to do something for God. All you got to do is show up for God. My God, Peter's the best example of that that we can see. Deny Jesus one minute, next minute walking on water. Oh, help me this morning. Thank you, Lord. What, what verse did I leave you at? Two? Two? Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Lord. Come on, say praise the Lord. Lord. Thank you, Father. Verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In God's great mercy, verse 3, I'm at, he has caused us to be born again. If you're bodacious enough in writing your Bible like I do, write restored. Write restored out there. To be born again means to be restored. My God, if we could get, again, the concept of what that really means. Yeah, we come to church. That's great. Many of us have lost the love of our first salvation and joy of the Lord because church people have a tendency to wear you out and wear you down. You come into a church, we expect there to be the joy of the Lord, and there's frown faces and uh, and just somehow or another, everybody's all bound up in in their own problems. I don't come to you to talk to you about your problems. I come to you for you to tell me, give me a word in season. The Bible says to them that are weary, strengthen me. I need you to survive. I don't need you to tell me, well, I don't know if I can. I don't even know if I believe in God. You are not the right one for me to talk to at that moment. Let me move on to somebody. I will not leave you there, but I got to leave you for the moment. Somewhere somebody's going to tell me, Pastor Tommy, you can do it. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. This journey is filled with hardships. The Bible says that through many trials and tests, we must enter the kingdom of God. I know it's tough out here. But I can't afford to get caught up in somebody's own pity party. Talking negative and down about themselves. Well, you know, and and, and I'm going to say this because this is what the Lord gave me this morning when I was showering. Not to be too revealing. But anyway, he said this to me. He said people act like pigs because they think like pigs. And I say, well, well, I feel like a porker. You are not a porker. But if you continue to feel like a porker, you will act like a porker. And a porker will manifest in who you are. The next thing you know, pigs attract pigs. They don't attract horses and eagles. (laughs) 
I wish I could, man. I am, I am. Yes, yes, ma'am, I am. Hallelujah. Huh. He, 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 he takes the time, Peter of all people, takes the time to explain to us that you have been born again. God help me. You have not, you have not been as, as uh, uh, not Zacchaeus, but as, as the gentleman asked the question, how could a man enter back into his mother's womb? And Jesus said, you're not getting it. It is not that physical manifestation. And most of us get caught up in the physical reality of whatever's going on. If my bank account is in the red, then I am depressed. And I turn to weak and beggarly elements, Galatians 4, 4 and 8. I turn back again to weak and beggarly elements of my flesh because my flesh, I told you this before, will never get enough. If I am addicted to pornography, I'm addicted to pornography because I don't know who I am. And if I don't know who I am, how could I possibly know who Jesus is? So when I get upset I act out I can't control my temper you are a liar you do not have the right to blast off on anybody because you feel that way in the current emotional context of where you are you can govern your own spirit the Bible says that a man who cannot govern his own spirit is like a wall city well taken with no walls it let's be let's be let's be real it, it, let's call it what I don't want to control my my anger. I'm born again. I, I am, I am, I am a new creation. Hold your place there real quick. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Hold your place there. Come, come back there. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Because somebody doesn't know this and I'm making too many assumptions this morning. And I'm, I don't want to do that. 2 Corinthians 5. Glory to God. Help me, Jesus. Are y'all right? Do it. Second Corinthians five. Y'all know it. I know all. I know most of y'all life pointers know this, but it, it, it bears repeating. Amen. Jesus said again, "I say unto you, Hallelujah." Thank you, Father. Let's let's turn to verse sixteen. If you got to say Amen, He says, "From this time on, we do not think of anyone as the world does. Amen. In the past, we thought of Christ as the world." But we no longer think of him in that way. Verse 17, if anyone belongs to Christ, there you go. You lose your self-allowance and your self, uh, uh, um, we were talking about it the other day at dinner. Um, um, God hates self-reliance. You, you are not responsible for making sure that everything works in your life. Where we get that? Right? Thank God. God will not get, who said media? Media. Most of us get most of our information, which is mostly 90 plus percent bad, from the world, from the media. Come on now. Who ain't got one of these in their house? And I said it just, who ain't got one of these in their house? Who ain't got one? Y'all know what I'm saying. I don't care if y'all think about me talking bad English. I know how to speak properly. I can, I can walk into the right place and speak the correct language and the correct way with the right inflection and speak to a crowd that might be highly more intellectual than I am and let them know that your argument really does not hold very much water because if you look at it from the context of how God writes it in the Bible, it simply does not scientifically match up with what God has said. I'm telling you, how many of y'all ain't got one of these in your house? You got one, it says it in there. It says that you are a new creation. Why we act like old creations when God made us new creations? Because somebody told you that you had to perform like a monkey on a string at the, at the what's that thing called? The carousel, but what's it called? Well, it's something else. Organ grinder, organ grinder. We running around. The organ grinder is the devil, and we hopping around from blessing to blessing. Oh, I hope God meet my need. Oh, I hope I get my hit. Y'all ain't helping me this morning. But we are not on the organ grinder. We are on the potter's wheel, and the potter has decided to make us a new creation from the inside out. I know I'm preaching in this place today. I didn't mean to, but I know I am. But the power of God has come to make you victorious in every area of your life. But you got to start with the way you think about yourself. Stop crying about everything. They ain't treat me right. Probably because you didn't act right. 
They don't smile at me. Most folks don't smile no day, nowadays because there's so much stuff going on in the world. You don't need to be smiled at. You'll be the one smiling. The Bible says that he would desire friends must what? First show himself to be friendly. Oh. Uh, 17, 17, 17. That's the only reason why I turned over here. Make sure I didn't lose my place. Did I lose my place? I don't think so. I think I did. 17. So I'm going to read 16. So from this, no, I read that. If anyone belongs to Christ, there is, a, there is a new creation. The new creation has arrived, my Bible says. Or that person has become a new creation. The old things have gone. Everything. What does the word everything mean? Everything. It means everything is made new. Verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ made peace between us and himself and gave us the work of reconciliation. Turn back to where I left you off in 1 Peter. I'm almost finished. Can I keep going just a few minutes? Glory to God. See, because see, it's, it's time out. You know, we, we want these things and deser deservedly, we should have them. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, look, the word starts right here with me. <clears throat> Start right at my door. My wife and I, we, we get on each other. We do, Robin. I told her last night, don't tell me to shut up. <laughs> she, see, see, by this action, she ain't had to say nothing. <laughs> told me shut up. How long y'all been married? 53. Have you, has either one of y'all ever told the other one to shut up? Yeah. No, say that like. I might have one. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she said I might have one. <laughs> she, she, said, I, look, she said I might have one. I, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take that. That's enough. Look, you live close enough to somebody, you're going to tell them to shut up from time to time. And that don't mean that they don't need to shut up from time to time. But at the end of the day, that don't mean we get a divorce because she told me to shut up. Shut up, Robin. Y'all catch that one? Y'all catch that one, sir? I did. I did. She said, so did you? Yes, I did. I shut up and I walked away. Because if I had stayed, there would have been strife. And I can't afford strife. Because I can't preach like this with strife in my heart. Because I won't even, I'll be like this. I'll get ready to walk over here and walk over here. Walk up. Have we not seen it? Anybody, just an inside secret. If you ever want to know if, if a couple's really living what they're preaching, look at the spouse. Look at the spouse. That's the truth. She ain't saying amen. She ain't smiling. She ain't taking no notes. She just sitting there like, uh huh, uh huh, right? <laughs> anyway, anyway, let me finish up so I can get out your way. Okay, so so. Uh, first Peter, I want to get down to verse 5. Praise be, verse 3, to God and the Father of Lord Jesus Christ, in God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Say restored. restored. Come on, say restored. restored. What has he restored us into? A living hope because Jesus Christ rose. Right? From the dead. Now, verse 4, we hope for the blessings, hallelujah, that God has for his children. Well, how can you do that? Because you've been restored. You get born again. I tell people all the time, people that get hung up on prosperity. Well, you know, I don't really believe preachers should have airplanes. There's no other way for Dr. Savelle to get here unless he's got his own airplane. I'm going to tell you that right now. If you got a problem with that, you're probably not going to get anything out of the service. I'm going to tell you that right now. But what does he do? He said, listen, I'll come, but I got to come after I finish preaching in another city. He ain't coming. He ain't coming. He don't have to come here. Are you feeling me? Preach all over the world. I know his schedule. I know good and well. So my point is, prosperity doesn't begin with what you have. God. Prosperity begins when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord. And God ain't got no problem with you driving a, a Bentley. Ooh, it got quiet up in here. God ain't got no problem with you driving a Mercedes or BMW. No, you got the problem with it. More importantly, other people have the problem with it. More importantly, other people have a problem. You have a problem with what other people might think about you driving that car. Look. <laughs> Let me stop. Prosperity begins with Jesus. That's my point. Let me keep going. Some of you are like, what? Okay. Now we hope 
for the blessings, verse 4, God has for his children or the inheritance. These blessings, who said the inheritance? Somebody over here. This inheritance, which cannot be destroyed or spoiled. Boy, I wish you would underline that. Can I tell you this? It cannot be destroyed or spoiled, Peter says. Do you know what that means? Who knows what that means? Who really knows what that means? It cannot be destroyed or spoiled. Doesn't matter what you do, God still has it waiting for you. It is absolutely eternal. But the reality of it is, is if God has a house picked out for me, He's not going to say, Tommy, circumvent all these other houses to get to it. He might say, okay, I put you in this apartment over here, this little, little shotgun house. Some of y'all may not know what that means, but y'all have to go back a little bit to hear that. Shotgun house. Then I move you into a two-bedroom apartment. Then I move you into a suite or a townhome. Then I move you into somebody else's house that you might be leasing. But eventually, I'm going to get you to your house. And how you act in this house, oh God help me, how you act emotionally in the shotgun, in the apartment, in the townhouse is going to determine whether or not you ever get to the mansion that I have for you. My wife had been, she and I, because we're in the military, we lived in, in leased houses most of our lives. We had one opportunity to buy a house and didn't pull the trigger because the Lord told us not to and we didn't know it at the time. And every house that we've ever been in, we've, we've done better. We've made the house better than when we got in there. Everyone. 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 Why? Because my eyes are on something else. Let's keep going real quick. Let me finish real here. Okay. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I'm having too much fun up here. I'm preaching myself happy even if you ain't happy. I'm just telling you. My happiness is not based on my feeling. I'm just telling you that right now. So he says here. Uh, verse 5, God's power protects you through your faith. Oh, no, no, no. These blessings, which cannot be destroyed or be spoiled or lose their beauty, isn't that good, are kept in heaven for you. Now, please understand this. He's not talking about they're waiting for you in heaven. What he's talking about, they have been laid up for your, for your receiving. Do you remember James says that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, nor shadow of turning? They're there. The gifts are there. And I, I don't want to be one of the ones that gets to heaven and when we get to heaven, see all that I could have had but didn't. Now, I'm going to tell you all something. Look up at me real quick because I'm, I'm finishing. We, we, don't have enough, we don't have enough reality of heaven, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. What, I'm, what I mean by that is simply, you know what? So there's some people, first of all, they're scared to go. Death does not scare me. I have no fear of death. No fear of death. Even when I don't feel like I've done everything right, I don't have any fear of death because I know the word of God. Amen. Now, with that being said, when I get to heaven, my, my goal is to live, live the life well done, thou good and perfect servant. I think that's everybody's goal. But to live the life, to look back and say, you know what, I didn't, man, I got it all. Everything he had for me, I got it all. Even if it was a two-bedroom apartment, I got it all. Yeah, I ain't feeling me this morning. Somebody, everybody can't receive a mansion on this level. That's just the truth. But whatever he's got for me on the table, Psalm 23, y'all prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Where's that table prepared? Are there enemies in heaven? Who said right here? Somebody said right here. That table's prepared right here. It ain't prepared, prepared in heaven. How could it be? There's no enemies in heaven. So if Psalm 23 is true, thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. So my enemies are right here, so everything on the table belongs to me. They just sit back and watch wishing they could get to it, but they can't get to it unless I leave it on the table. All right, I've, I've run out, I think I've run out of time. I think I've run out of time. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Can I, can I give you three more scriptures? 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. I wasn't finished with 1 Peter. We will again revisit 1 Peter. I can guarantee you that by God's grace. Just don't know when, but we will get there again. Second Corinthians 5. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Second Corinthians 5. Where's my time? Am I out of time? Is that why you're not holding up? She's not holding up because I'm out of time. All right. It's 12.03. Boy, if y'all would listen faster, I'd get done faster. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. She said, I'm asking a lot. <laughs> Cause, okay. Well, you know, I preach fast. Don't I? 
You got to be like a speed reader, speed list, and interpret the tongue. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, glory. Okay, <laughs> Second Corinthians. <laughs> I just love Life Point, man. Y'all should bring some horns and some bells and whistles to church. I don't know why y'all not, man. Tell y'all what? Eh. I, I don't have no problem with it. If somebody else might have a problem. I ain't got no problem with it. So, yeah, the shofar. Thank you. What was that? All right, he, he pulled out the miniature shofar back there. Second Corinthians 5. Thank you, Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm listening. Just listening to the Lord here. Hallelujah to Jesus. Make sure. Yeah, yeah, I read, a, I read almost to this, but I didn't get all the way down there. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was getting better, as she said, as I went down further. Verse, I'm going to, I want to read to verse 21, but verse 19 says, God was in Christ making peace between the world and himself in Christ. God did not hold the world guilty of its sins. Boy, this is so profound. It's almost, it's almost ridiculous that we haven't gotten it by now. And he gave us this message of peace. Your Bible says reconciliation, King James. So we have been sent to speak or like ambassadors for Christ. It is as if God is calling to uh, you through us. We speak for Christ. Do you see that? When we implore you or urge you to be at peace with God. God made Christ, listen now, underline it, mark it, do whatever you do in your Bible to bring attention to it. God made Christ who had no sin or knew no sin, never sinned, to become what? Sin for us. So that in Christ we, be, we could become right or become the righteousness of God in him. Please, 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 don't go back and say something I didn't say. I did not say that sin is not real. I didn't say that. I did not say that. Come on. I did not say that sin is not real. Did I say that? I did not say that. Tell your neighbor he did not say that. I didn't say that God, I mean, that sin is not real. What I did say, and I didn't say it, the word says it, that God made him to be sin for us. Woo, Jesus. God, I both sick here. Come here, Zach. Come here, you're sitting on the end row. Come here. I pick on TJ all the time. I'll pick on you. Stand right there in the middle. Face the crowd. Face them, face them, face them, face them. And I've done this illustration before and to a certain measure. One or two. I represent Christ. He represents man. This man that God, Jesus Christ, as God, created, look that way for them, because I'm going to point something. I don't want you seeing me at all. This is important. <laughs> this God, who God, this man who God created, he created in his what? Image. image. Created in his own image, exactly. In his own image. Now, the one place that man has deviated from God's own image is right here. If I were to take a physical picture, which the Bible says no man has been able to do that, of God, he would look similarly like the construct of a human being. Yeah, I don't have to agree with that. You do your own study. I know I'm right about that. With that being said, then, then in, in this physical house, he looks like him or like me as Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ then comes to do, because this man, you stand right there, you stand right there. No, 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 you stand, you stand right there, face that way. Because he's the first man, Adam, right? What does the Bible say about Jesus? That he is the what? Second Adam. Very important. Second Adam comes. Here's the first Adam. The first Adam comes, created in the image of God, like I said earlier, and fall down to just one knee. Just fall down to one knee. He, he sins. And he now has fallen. Okay? Okay, you can get up. What happens is this man now, before he's reborn, takes on the image of a fallen man. Yes. Right? Yes. By birth. Say that. By birth. Not by action. His actions don't determine his fallen state. His birth does. Because he's born in sin. The Bible says, I've been born, I've got a Psalm 51. He's been born in iniquity. Now what happens is there has to be what the Bible says, and, and, and here, it's, here it's outlined for us, that there has to be a propitiation or a sacrifice for sin. So what happens in 2 Corinthians 5, God comes along and says that, listen, you are my man. You are, now step one, four, reborn. Mm. He's reborn because now I take his sin place. 
His sin place now rests on me as Jesus Christ. He can walk free. Go take a seat. He can walk free of sin. Come on. He's free of sin because sin now rests on me. God has made me as the son of man, the son of righteousness, to be sin, even though I never sin, so that you would never have to, you and I would never have to bear up under the weight of sin. But the one thing the enemy has done, he, we know this, we've been preached to, but our consciousness has not grasped the reality that I am not defined by the fact that I used to be a liar, or I used to be a thief, or I used to be a womanizer, or I used to be a straw, I used to walk the street as a, as a woman of the night, or as I used to be promiscuous, or I used to steal or whatever, all of those things now come together in Christ. So how do I get there, pastor? I get restored. I get reborn. But I am born again. Exactly. Then why are you still thinking about the time that you were on the stroll with a John you didn't know? God, why are you still thinking about, you know, Naomi and your wife's name is Lynette? Y'all ain't getting you. Because your mind has to be renewed. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but considered himself of no reputation. Let me break it down in a way that you can understand it. Tommy Roberts was a no good, do dirty dog. Even though I was married and we loved one another, I didn't know how to love her. But when Christ came along and he pulled me, for lack of a better term, by my shirt tail and said, or my collar said, boy, get in me and me in you. The Bible says if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. And so the transformation took place. But I can't keep gravitating to Miss Naomi. And to be clear, there's no Naomi in my past. I'm just using that name. But, but I can't keep, I can't, oh God help me. I can't be in Christ and keep gravitating to Naomi. I can't be in Christ and keep wanting to walk in Walmart and steal something. The Bible says, let him who stole, steal no more. So what's going to have to happen? I'm going to have to be restored in my mind. Yes. Romans 12. Come on now. We have to be renewed in our thinking. We've got to let the word of God change us from the inside. Yes. Amen. Psalm 51. 12. I got too much scripture. Let me be done. I really am. Give me back the joy of your salvation. Psalm 51 verse 12. Give me back or my Bible says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Rescue or keep me strong by giving or sustaining me in a willing spirit. God help me. Every day, every day, we have a life full of choices. And in the choice portion of our life, I can't say this in a nice way. I'm going to just say it the way it is. Whether it comes out nice or not, I don't know. I choose where I'm at, where I will be at tomorrow, not God. I make the choice whether or not I'm going to be happy or sad, both today and tomorrow. I would submit to you that if you're happy today, or if you're walking in joy today, you're doing it because you made a choice before you got here. And some of us may have even had to make the choice this morning that, you know what, I'm going. I, I, I'm just, you know, you walk into Walmart, you know, you know me and Walmart, you know, you walk into Walmart and, 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 and now my daughter-in-law is the customer service manager in Walmart, so I have to be careful talking about Walmart. But, 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 but you know, I walk into Walmart and I need help and I'm somebody, I'm walking in, can, 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 can help me, excuse me, can you, and they just walk on by, but they got one of them yellow vests on or blue vests on or something like that. I'm like, what, am I invisible? <laughs> what the devil does, turn with me real quick uh, to the book of Ephesians. What the devil does is he tries to use these little obstacles to keep us from having the real joy of the Lord being our strength. And joy is not based on your emotional context at the time. Joy is a, is a spiritual force that comes because you have made a decision that I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, 
I mean, whose life is perfect in here? Don't raise your hands. Your life ain't perfect. Because I, I guarantee you that if I looked at your life through the, through the magnification or the scope of, of humanity, I'm going to find something wrong with it. Guarantee you. Same thing with mine. Now, let me ask this question. Whose life is filled with joy? Every believer in the house, should hands should go up. Because I'm not looking at it from the human scope. I'm looking at it from, through, the, through the filter of God's holy word. And when I look at it through this, I see that I go from a base to abounding. I see that I am, though all these things come against me, they will not consume me. I see that he hath made me more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. So what that does is it gives me hope beyond what my physical reality says. And it has very little to do with my emotional feeling at the time. I know I didn't tell you where. I did on purpose because I didn't want you to get distracted. Chapter 2, verse 6, last verse for today. Ephesians 2. See, I'm going to use this. Thank you. Do you have a say, man? I'm going to use this as the best illustration I have at the moment as the Holy Spirit leads me. <coughs> Excuse me. Galatians 2. First. I mean, I'm sorry. Ephesians. I'm sorry. I'm looking right at Ephesians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody thought, oh, my gosh, he's going to another scripture. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, of course, you know, I'm going to tell you to back up. You knew that anyway. Verse 4. 2, 4 says, but God's mercy is great. Say amen to that. He loved us very much. Say amen to that. Amen. Though we were spiritually dead because of the things we did against God, our transgressions. I just showed you the illustration. You know how you did that against God? You were born. You were born. Amen. He says he gave us new life. That's your gift. That's my gift. Amen. What does that mean? I've been restored. I've been restored with Christ. He says you have been saved by God's grace. Verse 6. He raised us up with Christ. Gave us a seat with him. In the heavens. He did this for those in Christ Jesus. So that for all future time, not just the 120 years that you live on this earth, but for all future time, he could show the very great riches of his grace by being kind to us in Christ Jesus. And ultimately, what I submit to you today for your thinking finally is simply this. That if God didn't make you hear these messages, of course you had a part to play in it, you wouldn't believe it. There's no other reason for Life Point Christian Faith Center to exist in this community, none whatsoever. Close your Bibles. Close your Bibles. There's no reason for Life Point Christian Faith Center to exist in this community other than God wants you to hear something that you have not continually heard or at a level that you haven't heard it before from another place. Doesn't mean other churches aren't relevant. I'm not suggesting that at all. But, but see, we read over 1 Peter that God chose you. You were chosen. You know, you are a peculiar person. Good place to say amen. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Because as a, as a peculiar person, it means um, we were having a discussion yesterday, sitting around the round table at uh, somebody's house. We were having a discussion. And uh, the topic came up about words and faith. The reason why we talk about faith is because anybody can speak words. And unless there's something wrong with them, everybody is speaking words. Somebody was telling me a testimony about a, a prayer group with, that they were at or something like that, a Bible study, and the person that was talking was speaking in Korean or, or even singing in Korean, whatever. But everybody that was there got, got what they were saying, even though they didn't speak Korean. Now, why am I saying that? Because the significance of words will never be minimized in the kingdom of God. It is absolutely how God gets things done in the kingdom. Still. Always has. Always will. I'm not going to change that. Okay? With that being said, what we have to do, we were talking about this portion yesterday, and we used um, one of her relatives as an example, and, and my wife was saying it's true, that there is, there is the ability to speak and encourage yourself on a natural, um, humanistic level. If not, what's that guy you listen to? I couldn't think of his name. Um, I almost had it. Brown? What's his name? The, the, the motivational speaker. Les Brown. Anybody ever heard of Les Brown? Anybody ever heard of Tony Robbins? Or any other motivational speaker? Why do you think they're successful? Because they're telling you to say and do things to make your natural mind acclimate to the words that you speak. That's a spiritual reality. Now, is, I'm not suggesting anything when I say this, but just because somebody stands up and is a motivational speaker to you, does that make them uh, a child of God? No. 
So what it makes them is tapping into a reality that exists for all of us. If you get up and you, I'm telling you, and I wouldn't harp on this so much, but I know why God is talking about this restoration process. Too many of us talk negatively about ourselves and we mask it, we mask it in insincerity. And what I mean by that, is, come here, son. I mean by that is that, you know what, you know, uh, he, come here, let's just stand here. I, I can't, listen, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me for taking too much of your time, but forgive me. I can't stand when people come up to me and they say they do this kind of stuff. You know, you know what, I love you. You know, I, I know I ain't been perfect. <laughs> you know, you ever have anybody that have that false laugh, that insecure laugh? You, you know it when you hear it, okay? Um, you know, I know, I'm, I'm, I, well, you know, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a black preacher. <laughs> Y'all know, you see, see, some of y'all know what I'm talking about now. You understand what I'm saying? That is a, that is a lie of the devil. You know, well, you know, I, I can't really do anything because I'm, I, you know, I didn't go to college. <laughs> you know, listen, listen, stop it. And what we do is we just, we just, uh, you know, or, or, you know, I just grew up, I grew up in Romulus, New York. So, you know, you know, God really, you know, I'm just from Romulus. And you start making excuses about why you see yourself in a negative light. Well, you know, us Roberts, you know, we ain't never had no, no real money, you know, no property, you know, but God is good. And, and, it's this, and it's this sense of insecurity that the devil uses to slowly, ever so slowly, gradually drive a wedge between you and the mind of Christ. God intends for you to be successful. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you divorced. I don't care if you white, black, Asian, Hispanic. Male, I don't care if you overweight, I don't care if you underweight, I don't care if you short, fun size. That's what they told me. Or if you extra large, because you six feet and old, I don't care. I don't care where you live, I don't care where you work. God can use and likes to use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And the base thing of the world to bring to naught the things that are. But you've got to fix your mouth. Yeah. And ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, listen, as my last point is this, your mouth is not the source of your emotions. Contrary to popular belief, your mouth is not the source of your emotions. I don't say, oh, I'm happy. He, he, he. No, 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 no. You know why I can smile? Because I've already got a spirit of joy or happiness in me. You know, I'm, I may not be carrying as much paper. Y'all know what I mean by that? Cheddar, money, for those of y'all ain't figured out that. I may not be care, I may not have the portfolio that I want, but, it, but I certainly will not let it make me sad. Not as long as I'm a tither. <laughs> Bow your heads with me. Father, we give you praise. I want to, I want to just for, I'm going to make it quick, but I'm going to make it impactful. This morning, there may be somebody in here. I'm not going to assume anything. Far be it for me to assume anything this morning you may not be born again you may not be restored and you may not know wow I didn't even know what that meant I know some people call it being saved that's it that's the term for it I know people call it uh, repentance that's the term for it but ultimately what it means is being placed in the correct position between you and God being his child and he being your father and that makes you a new creation if you accept it the, tra the tragedy of mankind will be that many people will have had opportunity to accept and reject it because they looked at it as a small thing or insignificant. I trust that will be no one this morning in this place. If you have never been, never accepted Jesus Christ, and let's be careful, baptism does not signify, being baptized as a child does not signify salvation. Just because you've gone under the water doesn't mean that you're born again. Just because you've been sprinkled doesn't mean that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if you have in your heart a desire to be restored and say, hey, what does it cost me? Well, my willingness, my obedience, my want to. I got to want to. If you have a want to this morning, with every head bowed, I want you to just lift your hand up this morning. If you've never been born again, would you lift your hands? I want to pray with you. And I just want to lead you into a prayer of salvation. Lift your hands. Every head is bowed. I want your hands up nice and high so I can see them. Glory to God. Okay, I see your hand. I see your hand. All right. Now, I want everybody to pray this prayer with me today as, as we conclude. Before I do that, if there's some of you, and I know this because I grew up in a, in a religious environment, maybe you did something bad, horrible, 
Maybe you cussed. I don't know. You might think that's horrible. I think that's human, but I'm not going out and being a curse advocate. <laughs> I'm not just throwing epithets and, and curse words out just because I have grace. That's not how it works. But maybe I hit my finger at my hand with a hammer. And instead of Jesus coming out, it came out something else. I don't know, whatever your reality is. But I can tell you that the blood of Jesus is there to forgive it. So if there's anything, no minor, no matter how minor I said, maybe, maybe there's something real. Maybe in your past you did something that you've just been struggling with. Can I tell you that you have been restored if you accept Jesus? And so what I want you to do is if you've fallen away, backslidden, whatever you want to call it, let's repent today and get back on the right path. And all that does is open you up for continued success through Jesus Christ in the family of God. Could I pray with you this morning? With every head bowed, would you lift your hands if you need to repent this morning? I just want to join my faith with you. That's all I want to do. All I want to do, just repent. Amen, amen. All right, I see your hands. Put your hands down. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, come on, stand to your feet. I want you to join hands with just, don't cross the aisle, but just join hands with the person to your, that side, the right side or left side of the aisle. Just join hands with one person. That's fine. Make sure everybody is touching your hand this morning. My Father, in the name of Jesus, you've seen the hands and the hearts of your people. You know, God, what it is that we struggle with. You know our reality. You know, God, that what we've said or done that has not measured up to the standard of the Word of God or the standard of Christianity. And so we just make an avenue of return and repentance. We make a safe place, God, where people don't have to run up and say, oh, I did this and that, but rather we simply say, God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me of my sin. Lord, I repent. I, I, I didn't mean to do it, and I don't want to continue to do it. I heard this man say today that, that Jesus, you have been made my sin. You, he made you sin for me. So I don't have to carry it anymore, and I don't want to carry it anymore. If that's you, say amen to that. And I also say, Father, for those that have never known you, they've never been in a close personal fellowship or relationship with you, that today is their day. Even those watching by, by television, God, I say in the name of Jesus that you are a God that is present no matter where they are right now. Your hand reaches them. Your love reaches them. The faith, the word reaches them to pull them into your kingdom. You're not trying to keep people out. You're trying to get them in. And so, Father, let us redeem this time or take full value and advantage of it. And we say now, Lord, I am your daughter. I am your son. Accept me. Accept my heart that's open for change. God, thank you for restoring me. Thank you for making me a new creation, a new being that never existed before. All my sins have been forgiven, both those in my past, those in my present, and those yet to come. You place them on Jesus. So I will leave them there even when I don't feel like it. When I don't feel worthy, that's when I will walk closer to you and say, hey, God, I'm not feeling it today. I'm running to you. I know you've made me better. Help me control this emotion that makes me feel less than what you want. So Father, today I pray by your great Holy Ghost that you would just lead these people into a new reality and revelation of what it means to be restored and move from restoration to harvest. As we traverse this subject, God, as we go to higher heights and deeper depths, take us, God, to a new reality and a spirit understanding that your love is just the way we are. Whatever's not right, you'll fix. Whatever needs to go, you will make sure by our obedience that it's gone. I love you. I know they do too. We love the hand that we hold. We speak life, prosperity, healing, wholeness, and wellness over every one of our sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus. We give you praise. Till the next time we come together, you are, you are Lord, and you're worthy to be praised. Come on, give the Lord a great big shout of praise. Amen. Amen.